Hey everybody, welcome to the Twin Bill Baseball Podcast. I'm What a Day Joe, joined by the player and of course special guest Dan, the smartest man in the room. He's always the smartest man in the room. And uh, we are talking today about the greatest teams of all time. Probably a very opinionated segment coming up. I can probably tell you that much. But uh, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving uh, weekend. It's, it feels like it was like the longest weekend for some reason. Yeah, I don't yes, know why. absolutely. I don't know if it's the moon and the stars or whatever, but I feel like I've been off for like six days. But it's it's been crazy. <laughs> I've been on a yeah, I've been on a food bender, but I'm kind of off yeah. now. Food coma. Yeah, that's yeah. always a good thing, right? Dan, did you have turkey? Actually, no. I made no. prime rib this year. Oh, prime, wow. nice. nice. Fresh cut prime rib? Oh, yes. Yeah, carved it myself. Medium nice. rare. Uh, yeah, medium oh, got rare. To be. If, you, if, you're, if you're slow roasting prime rib, it's got to be medium rare. Oh, you, my see, God. you see any brown in a prime rib, you did it wrong. Did so you, if, I went to, um, if I went to a good restaurant and I ordered well-done prime rib, would, they, would I get like the uh, the chef in Caddyshack with the, you know, coming out with the hatchet? <laughs> You guys will hate me because I love my meat well done. Oh God, no! I like mine burnt, Joe. When I when I when I, I get when myself. I get the like the when I get the prime rib, I ask for the end cut because I know it's probably cooked. Yeah. See, now the end cut of a prime rib is a little different. You get like a, a sirloin or a strip steak and ask right. for it well done. Yeah. yeah. At that point, you're yeah. As as Hank Hill said, ask them politely and firmly to leave. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I've had chefs come out and tell me you do not want to cook this piece of meat well done whether it's filet or whatever, there's 50 day aged lamb or something like that. But nonetheless, uh, all right. Thanksgiving behind us now, Christmas looking ahead, but today we're talking the greatest teams of all time. Benny, again, you sent an email out and you know, I got pages and pages of numbers. I'm, I'm and the stats hardest working podcast. And what can I say? I can't wait for you to do my taxes this year. That's, <laughs> that's one thing uh, I'm looking forward to, but nonetheless, I'm going to let, I'm going to let uh, the player kick this thing off here. Um, let's go for it. Jump right in. What do you want to do? Well, I, I, maybe we go around and, and do our top two or three teams. And okay. then maybe we go back and forth and defend our case. So, um, I, I guess I'm going to be first. I'm going to do the number three team as the 1970 Baltimore Orioles. Ooh, I'm okay. going to do the second team as, and Dan and I think are going to debate this one. The second team as the 1939 Yankees, and the number one team is Murderers Row, the 1927 Yankees. Yeah, 27 Yankees. That yeah, that was that was huge. Dan, what do you got? Top three. Yep. Benny, Benny hit it right on the head because he and I, when he pitched the idea of the show to me and we started talking, I remember we were debating over the Yankees because obviously I have uh, I have the 1970 Orioles as my number two. Okay. Uh, my number three was the 1975 Reds. Oh, uh, yeah. And this is where Benny and I disagreed because he was pitching uh, 67 or excuse me, 27. And I picked the number one as the 39 Yankees. Wow. So you left it, you left the 27 Yankees out of the top three altogether. Well, I I didn't I figure we were all picking different ones. That's why. Oh, all right, all right, all right. You know, okay. They they would they would definitely bump to 75 Reds if I if we were allowed okay. to pick different. But when I said when I said uh 39 and you were like, oh, it's 20, was it 60? You said 98, 60. I, yeah, I said 61, six. 98, yeah. and 27. That's but right. I, you actually, I have to thank you because I, you know, the 39 Yankees, I thought were a great team. But when I actually, you know, then I drilled down and, and I did some analysis. Yeah. They, I mean, they're, they're top of the heap or, you know, at least one or two. The I 39 guess can, Yankees, you saw them play, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I was in high school. I'm like, <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I kept mine simple. I just narrowed it down to the two. I, I mean, I love the 27 Yankees murders row and all that stuff. A lot of history with that and so forth. But coming from the Northeast and all that, I had to kick mine off with the 86 Red Sox. I mean, I was right there with the rest of Red Sox nation about to pour that sh- glorious glass of champagne one strike away and the wheels come falling off. So that, you know, at 16 years old, I got my first real taste of heartache. Um and then, of course, the 2004 Red Sox. They finally ended that 86-year drought. Uh, the curse yeah. of the Bambino was lifted, finally, you know. And um, I don't know if – I think I mentioned this before on the, on the previous podcast. But, you know, the curse of the Bambino uh, kind of originated with a couple of retired uh, Red Sox numbers at Fenway Park. 
I, I do believe it was um, Ted Williams, number nine, Bobby Doerr, number four, Pesky, I think it was one, and eight was Yastrzemski. And they put those numbers up at Fenway, 9418. September 4th, 1918 was the last time the Red Sox won the World Series. So what happened wow. is the year before, they started, they started retiring other people's numbers. And started throwing, I think Carlton Fisk got up there. With 20, so they, they kind of unscrambled the numbers a little bit. And then miraculously, in 2004, yeah, it, it happens. You know, they finally ended that drought. Um, they, they, were, they, were, um, they were a bunch of idiots. That is for sure. They were a bunch. You know, they they had that money ball mentality where they went out and got a bunch of, you know, close to has beens or no names. Um, the likes of Damon. You know, I mean, guys that we didn't even know. Uh, at the time, before they before they got big, Kevin Millar. Nobody, I didn't even know who Kevin Millar was. Um, you, you knew Damon if you were an A's fan. An A's fan, right? Exactly. And it's funny. It, it, and during those time frames, because the year before in 03, Wakefield gave up the home run to Aaron Boone, and that ruined our chances there. But to get to these pennant, we always played the A's. It was like three years in a row, the Red Sox and the A's went at it, and it was either somebody was on the team before or vice versa, and it was it was very weird um, psychosis there. That's the word I'm looking for, but uh, very strange dynamic with that. But, you know, my thing with the 2004 Red Sox, I don't know if you've ever seen the specials on, but it all started with Kevin Millar getting on base and then the pinch hit by the pinch run for Dave Roberts. He comes mm -hmm. on. And it starts with a wink of an eye. He there was no signs or anything for him to steal first, uh, steal second base in the ninth inning with two outs. They were literally one out away from the, you know ending this. And he looked at Terry Francona and just winked at him. And Terry just said, "Go for it." And um, no signs were given. That's you know, and he just barely beat the tag, you know. And then of course Bill Miller singled up the middle, and the rest is history, you know. And then the right. the biggest comeback in in baseball, you know, or, you know it's funny when you Google this stuff. It they talk about the Yankees' biggest choke, but then no one talks about the the greatest comeback. You know, three. You know, the next yeah. three the next three games went into like two in the morning, extra innings. Right, they and, did, and, and I mean that because that was the first time because it was they were down. I mean, that was the first time anybody had ever come back down yeah. three one, and uh, you know, one not just the the A series period, right. but the ALCS. I mean, yeah, it um, was crazy. I mean, you got you had um. What's his name? Mariano Rivera was lights out every time yeah. we played him. And for some reason, you know, and I do believe um, the moon had something to do with it, too, because they won. The, they ended up winning the World Series, obviously, over St. Louis. But it was right. under a full moon type thing. There's a lot of crazy thing. The bloody sock, you know, the whole kit and caboodle. You, you throw all this stuff in there. And, you know, that's like that magic thing that happens. You know, th there, there were no great power hitters on the Red Sox in 86. I mean, I'm sorry, in 2004. It, it just wasn't that. We had Manny Ramirez. I, I don't think he hit more than 40-something home runs. And he was our power hitter, but he also struck out a lot. It was all right. or nothing with Manny Ramirez, you know. And plus, you had his antics, you know, going to the bathroom yeah. inside the green monster in between innings right. and things like that. You know, hence the, uh, the idiot what, nickname. <laughs> what they call it, Man Manny being Manny, wasn't it? Yeah, that Manny thing? being Manny, exactly. So we had a lot of um, – the, the sports writers had a field day with this. But, you know, the magic that in, in 04 was just unbelievable. Um, to, to live during that time, you know, there was a sign on one of the expressways. It was um, – for some reason, it's been there for years. It's on Starro Drive right outside Fenway Park. It says reverse – um, curve coming up when you're getting off the highway, and somebody that the night they won it spray painted reverse the curse <laughs> on the sign. That, and that they, been, yeah. they left it there for weeks because that's how incredible the uh, right. World Series was. So, you know, so the argument could be made: greatest team ever. I, it, it's going to be right up there. It's, I, I think. Uh, Time out one the, the, let, me, let me get the pub. The player seems to. Well, it's agrees. obvious Benny's uh, Benny's canine cohort is not a Red Sox fan, so. I, I guess so. I guess so. But uh, yeah, so I mean, to me, 2004 was a magical year. Greatest comeback. I I don't know if you'll ever see that again. I no, mean, probably probably not. Um, nope. I mean, there's a couple of numbers we we're going to talk about Very tonight nice. that we'll never see again. Yeah. Um, but that's like I said, when Benny and I were bouncing back and forth 
because yeah. he he said you know obviously ninety eight the ninety eight Yankees always get a lot of a lot of praise and then sixty six and twenty seven and I guess thirty nine right. just kind of slipped through the cracks. Yeah. But, you know, so, I mean, yeah. Go ahead, I'm Benny. curious, you know, Dan. You so you have the 39 first, and I have the 27. I, I it was really, really close. Actually, I had the 39 uh, first until I, uh, I I actually looked at a couple of more metrics, and then I changed it. Great, stop. 39. Try to pull it up here. <laughs> yeah, 30. Uh, 39 was. I mean, that was obviously. You know, Bill Dickey, Joe DiMaggio, Joe yeah. Gordon. Um, but I think it's important to note for 39, and this is kind of what we were going back and forth on, to this to this day, I mean, you're coming up on 100 years ago. It won't be too long. Yeah. It was 100 years ago. Wow. And they still have the greatest run differential, or uh, excuse me, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, yeah, the, the, what is it, the run differential. I was right, the, the of any team, they they outscored their opponents. They were plus four hundred eleven for the, for that yeah. series. I mean, that's that's and close. It's like over two and a half runs a game. That's unbelievable. Exactly. And if you look at metrics, and this is where we were going to get into the. I've got a nice little bit for for actual like analytics math. Benny and I both being big numbers guys. Um, they if it's not just that that they were winning by almost three runs a game. Right. It's that you look at who they were playing. They were batting against some of the greatest pitchers of their generation. They were throwing to some of the greatest batters around. I mean, uh, roughing and obviously uh, lefty Gomez was on that team. Yeah. All uh, hall of famers. Yep. Yeah. Five, they have five, five hall of famers, numerous all stars. Uh, it's just, it, it's hard to argue. Yes. Obviously 27, you know, babe and, and all that, but, when you look at what they did in 39, it's, and, and this is, I mean, as an Orioles fan praising the Yankees, like, right. you know, it's just, it, they hit records. It's like DiMaggio's hitting streak. There's things that you'll just never see. Nobody is ever going to get 412. 411 will stand forever. What, um, real quickly, Joe DiMaggio, what year was he in when he went in 39? Do we know? What do, you, what do you mean? What year? What? What? Yeah. Was he a rookie? Was he? How many years into the league was he? Because thirty nine um, seems. I mean, I, I don't know. That he, was. I. I want to say thirty five was his rookie season. So. So he's only four years in. DiMaggio was thirty six. Was his rookie season? So there you go. A, his oh, so, fourth year. Okay. And so Garrett fourth only year, played, right. I think so Garrett had twenty eight at bats that year. In right. Thirty nine. That's incredible. I mean, the but, stats. I mean, here. you figure thir- what thirty? He was he pretty much until until his uh, uh, not injury. What was it that shortened his forty three? Um, the 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 war, but after forty three, right? When when you know because he had the gap, but pretty much he was an all star every year he played. Sure. So yep. yeah, he he only had uh, you know thirty six was a shorter season, but he was still everybody knew it going in. Yeah, some of these guys. I mean, Red Ruffing. I mean, look at that. Look at those numbers. I mean, twenty-one and seven on the year. I mean, twenty-game winners yeah. back then. I mean, yeah. That's and her panic. The two, yeah, the two right. top 30, stars are Hall of Famers. 30, 39. I mean, Dimaggio was MVP in thirty-nine. Yeah. So I mean, that was hit three eighty-one. Yeah. Yep. One hundred twenty-six ribbies. Yeah. I'll, I'll take because yeah, Dan is right that they, you know, the the highest run differential four eleven. Uh, the best ERA was the three point three one. Um, so wow. they scored 967 runs. The Red Sox were the second at 890, but you know runs allowed only 556. Wow! And the second place was Cleveland, the Cleveland Indians, 700. So it wasn't even close. I mean, yeah. now and their ER team ERA was 3.31. Second place was Cleveland at 4.08, and they led the league in home runs with 162. Wow! And um, the, I guess the second place was Boston in 164. The reason why I chose the 27, and up until like an hour before the show, yeah. I had the 39 Yankees number one. But then I looked at one more stat and um, what it was. And, then, you know, the same thing with the 27 Yankees. Of course, Murderer's Row, you got uh, you got Lou Gehrig was the MVP that year, Hall of Fame. Tony Lazeri, Hall of Fame. Babe Ruth, Earl Combs. And then the first two starters, Wade Hoyt and Herb Panic. So you had... Six Hall of Famers, um, and 
their run differential wasn't quite as much, 371. Right. Um, close, though. I mean, you know, to the 39 Yankees, uh, their, their team ERA was 3.20. Second was the White Sox, 3.91. But um, the, what the, 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 the stat that nudged me to push them number one was they had 158 home runs. Yeah. And the second place team was the Philadelphia Athletics with 56. Wow. So they out homered like every, every, any two teams combined. So that, that was the, you know, that kind of nudged me between, I mean, it's so close. I mean, what pops out of me is Babe Ruth, 60 home runs, 164 RBIs. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, Babe, Babe Ruth like, had more, had more home runs that year than the entire second closest team. I, I believe it with numbers like that. Yeah. And, and but he, can you imagine like Babe hit a hundred, knocked in 164 runs. That's and crazy. that wasn't even the highest on the team. And you have a guy like Bob Musell, who was a great hitter, hit yeah. 337, which you know could win a batting title almost any year. And he was yeah. in fourth place on his own team. That's wow. how good they were. Well, look at Gehrig with 173 RBIs. That's, That's insane. It's insane. I mean, yeah. you look at and I mean, not, which I think I, I mentioned it a couple shows ago. His his RBI total is even more impressive when you figure 60 of his at bats were right. with empty bases. Wow. Because he right. batted after Babe Ruth. That's amazing. That's that's incredible. I mean, and then I'm looking at the pitching Hoyt with 22 wins, Pennick with 19, Sharko with 18. I mean, those are serious wins for pitchers. And their their quote unquote closer, we'll see more. In yeah. Relief, yeah. Had 19 wins. That's insane. Yeah. That so you, you had a 20, 22, and two 19s and an 18. I mean, the the, the best, uh, the only team team I. I can think of with a better pitching staff. So team. we'll see more. Players. You got, we'll see more. He was the closer. He had 12 saves on the season or during the series. No, for the season to so keep 12, in mind, you know, back then a save really wasn't a thing because, you know, these guys are throwing complete games. It's not well, like, that, you know, well, there was no such thing as a pitch count. Right. That, that'd be my question for the, for these guys, the 27 Yankees, like they obviously you had pitchers throw complete games, but, if somebody came in for a save, what was, you know, what is it now? Like anything more than four and a half runs or something like that. It's not considered a save or something like that. So these guys coming in looking at these RBIs and these run differentials, they must've been up like 10 to two well, every game. And, you know, there's no save really there. <laughs> yeah. I, I, something that I wanted to note with the third, with 30, the 39 Yankees, yeah. their biggest loss of the year was they they to the Phillies they lost or excuse me to Philadelphia they lost seven to one. Yeah. Their biggest win differential was against Detroit and they won twenty two to twenty two to two. And they oh, had wow. a dozen games at least where they were wow. winning by at least twelve to fifteen runs. So you figure you get four uh, four yeah. eleven, like Benny said, that's almost three three runs a game. And that's it that's in a season you lost they were they were they lost 45 times and yeah. tied once. So they wow. were 4-11 with 46 games that they didn't end up with a higher run total. That is absolutely insane. I mean, I'm just like, like I wonder if, they, if they've ever blown any leads. <laughs> They're up 15-0 and they yeah. just barely win. And, and you know, I, I have to say, it's it's also kind of a 39 gets a soft spot because that was Gehrig's last year. Granted, yeah. he only played in, in eight games that season. Right. Uh, batted hit four hits and one RBI, but still yeah. like, you know, that, that moment of him, of his last at bat at a Yankee was in 39. So that's got a, that, that gets a bonus point there. Unbelievable. Some of these, so the, are... the, the 98 team that was, I think what one fourteen and 48 doesn't even make my top. I mean, I put them behind probably the big red machine. Sure. Yeah, I had him. I had him behind the seventy-five reds. I mean, seventy-five reds. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Well, that's a great, which is a phenomenal team. Now, seventy-five is that when Fisk hit the home run? Was that seventy-five? Yeah, yeah, with seventy-five, right against Morgan and Joe Morgan and all those guys. Right, mm -hmm. right. That was Game Six, and we lost in Game Seven or something like that. Yep. Or yeah, yes. Yep. Okay. You figure they had was it uh, Morgan Bench Perez yep. Ken Griffey Senior, of course Pete Rose. Yep. Yeah, they had a lot of Hall of Famers, or yeah. obviously not Pete Rose, but well, a um, lot of Hall of Famers and one travesty of his baseball history. Yeah, I'm, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. So let's talk a little bit more here. I'm going through our this tax bracket again. Um, well, if if I may, 
Go ahead, um, jump in, jump in. I wanted to get actual numbers. And Benny, we, we, whenever he and I are talking, we're always talking numbers. And you've seen some of the write-ups Benny sends out. Like, oh, clearly yeah. numbers, numbers. There's a metric that that is used a lot. I don't know if you're familiar um, with with the ELO, uh, the ELO numbers, ELO. Never, it's it's I've very heard, it's heard analytics. It, what they yeah. do is they it's it's a ridiculous looks like something you'd see on a chalkboard in the back of a calculus class. This this algorithm and it breaks down every possible metric to a number, uh, wow. win, loss, home, away, who's playing. It creates a score. So like, right. for example, but the, the, the cool thing about it is it, it, it always, it's always a zero balance. So sure. like if the Yankees beat the Red Sox and, and the, it had the uh, ELO score calculates that as 10, then the Yankees are now plus 10, the Red Sox are minus 10. So right. the entire season, and that allows the, the equation to transfer over exactly. to the following year when there's, you know, th to calculate players and all that, um, that's, I, I, I've used it, I've quoted it before because it's, they've broken it down with, with stats at the 50th anniversary of the Super Bowl, or excuse sure. me, Super Bowl 50, not the 50th anniversary, Super Bowl 50, <laughs> CBS Sports and USA Today did a big write up on the breakdown and calculated that the 91 Redskins were the best team to ever win a Super Bowl because of who they played, strength, the schedule, all this shit. Wow. So yeah. The the point I wanted to make with that is they did a breakdown a couple years ago. This was in 2018 of Tot. Now, granted, uh, I'm not saying, you know, if you want to say anybody from 2019 on, but mathematically they broke down uh, the best teams in history. And what they ended up doing was they assigned uh, – the best team from each team, like, you know, the sure. best Yankees team, the best Red Sox team. And then they did a score and the best team mathematically that they calculated was the 39 Yankees. Okay. Had an ELO score of 1623. And right. they were the first of all time. Um, the second, according to the ELO math was the 1906 Cubs, which, you know, everybody, that was, uh, you know, all the records that they broke. And then number three, Benny, that's where you you come back in. Was your your thirty? Or excuse me, <clears throat> the the twenty seven Yankees, right? And then it goes to the nineteen oh nine Pirates. Were four, and it, and it breaks down down from there. What's interesting is every if you you go you Google best teams of all time, the, right. the seventy five Reds, the seventy Orioles, they all show up top three, top five, pretty much every list. And that's, the, and that's based on that ELO metric? Cor correct. When you do the ELO score, the 1970 Orioles are mathematically the 19th highest score that they wow. the calculated. Wow. The uh, the 19 <laughs> – wait, let me, let me make sure I get these numbers right. <laughs> the uh, – where is it? Ba, 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 ba. The, the 1975 Reds actually weren't the highest scoring Reds team. That was 1976. Oh, wow. And the 1976 Reds were only the 23rd best team. So it was really it, when, you, when you you get the emotion out of it, it really is kind of interesting to break it down for you. Um, now, where, where were those metrics back then? <laughs> right. well, I, I think it's funny, you know, all the talk we had about the, we were talking about the Red Sox earlier. Right. The, according to the ELO score, the 1912 Red Sox were actually yeah. the statistically best, mathematically, I should say, best Red Sox team according to ELO, and they weren't wow. even top 40. Wow. The 1912 Red Sox were the 46th highest score. So it's, it's really like I, I it's what Benny and I were talking about. I kind of want to, you know, ha ha, whatever, because we're both math guys. Like I sure. could prove mathematically that the 39 Yankees were better than 27. So, yeah. Is there a, is there a place where you can see how the, the calcula calculation is done? Yeah, I can. I can forward you that. I, yeah, I, I mean, it sounds like a movie, uh, Good Will Hunting, that was filmed in Boston. <laughs> you know, the guys yeah, on the got board, that black that's, that's, that's like, you know, a, a thousand feet long. Yeah, you, right. <laughs> And if uh, if anybody cares, just for for humor's sake, the mathematically according to the ELO score, the worst team to have ever played professional baseball yeah. was the 1904 Washington Senators. Really? Yeah. I wonder what who are now the Minnesota Twins. So yeah. sorry to Twins fans out there. Um, the Twinkies are upset now. What was the? Uh, I thought the Cleveland Spiders, like from a pure <laughs> one loss perspective, was the worst. The, like you know in the that 1890s. might be. Cleveland. I mean, you, you figure there's some teams. You know the 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 Red Stockings, the the St. Yeah. Louis Browns. There's teams that don't exist anymore that were on the metric. So, wow. So I have to check that out. It's called the Elo metric system. Yeah, the Elo. It's an Elo score. I'll, okay. I'll send you. I'll, I'll forward it to Benny. He can 
Yeah, that, that's the I'd like to take a look at that because that that to me I just I would just love to see how they calculate all that. You'll probably uh, never hear from me again for because for the <laughs> remainder of my lifetime I'll be a hold away kind of doing running the numbers. It's it's funny it's funny that they were able to 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 break it down because the first time I ever saw an Elo score was yeah. basketball. Oh wow! And then they took it like, hey, based on basketball, we can expand these numbers to you know calculate football, baseball, you yep. know. I'm sure they probably have soccer and, and other sports out there too, but what do you know when this uh, Elo system came out? Actually, I do not know when no, I, when it, when it came out, I know the first time I saw it was about 10 years ago. Okay. So it's, it's been out for a few years at least. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Unbelievable. Just out of it's curiosity, fun. Dan, were, were the 71 Orioles from an Elo perspective higher than the, the 70? Uh, no, 70 was the highest. Yeah, uh, Elo score on in ball of of any Baltimore team because seventy one wow. was the year they had the four twenty game winners, correct? Yes. Okay, but I, remember, I was in seventy sure one they didn't win the series. Okay, so no, there you go. Okay, wow. that's that's I'll argue that till the day I die that the uh, you know the the seventy set because they lost that was when they got upset by the Pirates. The seventy one yeah. Orioles are the best team to have never won a series. Wow. And that's, I mean, it's got to be the best starting four of all time. Yeah. Easily. So wh which one are we talking about? I'm sorry. The, I'm just looking well, at 71 the, Orioles. Who, who are the 420 game winners for Baltimore? McNally, Palmer, Cuellar, and Pat Dobson. Okay. Yep. All right. And and good, good on you, Benny. Dobson is the, he's the other guy. He's the one everyone always seems to forget. Yeah. And the only reason why I remember him is because he came to the Yankees after that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what was it we said uh, a couple shows ago? It's like trying to name the three tenors. You know, yeah, everybody right. always gets <laughs> everybody Domingo. always gets Pavarotti right off the bat. It's, it's, it's that other guy, you know. You know, but like uh, who are the uh, three tenors? Hold on, Placido Domingo, um, one. um Pavarotti, and yep. who's the third one? Benny. I don't know. I think he was in Mr. Deeds. C C C Jose Carreras. Carreras. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's the other guy, the one that everybody always gets Domingo and Pavarotti. And, the, and, it's funny and, because and I went, I saw An Andrea Bocelli in New York City a few years back. So I always thought maybe he was one of the three tenors, but that's just like, wow, unbelievable. So, real quick, let's, uh, let's talk about my beloved Red Sox again. Let's go back to 86. Yeah. For a moment. Um, what a lackluster year that was. You know, I told you the story about how I saw the Roger Clemens game, 20 strikeouts. You get a ticket for a game later on in the season, and I get one. It's that random Saturday game against Toronto, and it's that game where they clinched the uh, the, the American League Eastern Division. And we were riding uh, that wave all the way against the Angels, and we almost didn't get to the World Series that year because – uh, we were, I think they were one out away, the Angels, and Gene Mock decided to switch pitchers. Dave Henderson gets up and hits a home run. And next thing you know, that just the wheels come falling off on the Angels. Uh, and then we go ahead and win game seven and we go on to play the Mets, in, you know, in the World Series. And, you know, that World Series was actually uh, a weird element to that was um, weather was a factor in that series. If you guys remember, if you, if you have any uh, interest in that. The weather, what happened was, is I want to say the game that we lost with the Bill Buckner, the following game was rained out. We had a, They ended up playing back-to-back -back games. It was a weird scenario um, with, the, with the ending of that series. And, you know, we all talk about Bill Buckner, why was he in the game, if he was hobbled by a bad foot and all that. And um, John McNamara had an interview back in 2011 where he had stated that the reason that he left Buckner in was because that was his only good first baseman. They had a backup by the name of Dave Stapleton. His nickname was called shaky. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not going to put him in, in a, in a situation. I like when you have like uh, Kurt Bleffrig on the old Orioles was clank. Yeah. And then clank. you had Dick, Dick Stewart on the uh, pirates was Dr. Strange club. Yeah. When you have nicknames like that, you probably want to keep them off the field. Yeah. And some of the some of the things that I was knowing for the '86 team that I forgot, uh, and we're we were talking about this too. Um, Reggie Jackson played for the Angels then. He was going around. He had these weird stints: one year with Oakland, two years with the Angels. And I'm watching some of these old videos, and there's Reggie Jackson striking out. He wasn't Mister October then, 
um, unfortunately. But, um, you know, oil can Boyd, obviously Clemens, Cy Young, MVP, 24 and 4, 2.48. Um, just some of the stuff that, that, that came out of that game was just the heartbreak is the number one thing that Boston fans will always remember. The, I tell the, you what, Joe. The one, one strike away. Never mind the one out away. We were one strike away. One strike away. And Bob Stanley was the pitcher, and I knew he was out of gas. Everybody did, but we were like, you just get one more strike and this thing's over, and it didn't happen. So, you know, that's that's a hot break. But it still, it took – they finished – I, I want to say they didn't – they came in. They didn't have a great record, I don't think. I'm trying to find their record. Their record wasn't stellar in 86. No, it was uh, 94. 95 and 60. Not, that's not, not even bad, a wild I mean. card nowadays. Um, you know, they were five and a half games over the Yankees, who at that time, the Yankees were kind of – they were staggering a little bit in the mid eighties, weren't they? Yes. They, they, were, they weren't doing too well. I think Detroit had a better record than them at one point. I remember that they the, didn't the Tigers get were the team uh, back into the postseason until yeah. what? 90, 95, I think. Yeah. When they got Clemens. Right. <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, you know, to, to me, I'm not, you know, we talk about the greatest teams. I say they're the greatest teams because I live through it, you know, on paper, statistic-wise, no, obviously they weren't the greatest team out there. But to to live through that, to me, there's that emotional element of that. I'm sure Dan, Baltimore Orioles, ha- you had to have witnessed some magic somewhere down the line with that team. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you figure they, they, they won the World Series when I was very young. And obviously, you know, I lived in Maryland and was yeah. at the 2131 game. I went to... You know, in the in the nineties, with I, th- I mentioned him before when they brought in like Geronimo Burrow and Roberto Alomar, and, and they had that run three two uh, three was it three of four years or two of two and three years they were in the ALCS, and if it wasn't for just as damn good as the Yankees and some of the other American yeah. League team, the Indians, the early nineties Indians, they would you know. Well, in the mid '90s, I should say '97. You know, they they never like they couldn't quite get over that hump. It's like the whole bit with uh, you know, I hate I hate to change sports, but everybody always points out the Packers. You know, yeah. they had a twenty what twenty four year, twenty five year run with two of the greatest quarterbacks, yeah. oh, arguably yeah. to have ever played, and they only won two Super Bowls because exactly. there was just there was just so many other teams right. who who you know w- when you look at like you know baseball, I mean. The, how many good, how many good, good American League teams were there in the late '90s, early 2000s when the Yankees won five World Series? Was it was it Benny five yeah. and seven they won, including the three yeah. in a row? They were the powerhouse. Uh, yeah, they were. Yeah, you know, yeah. how many how many people just couldn't quite get over the hump because the Yankees were that much better? Yeah, yeah, that was one of the things I remember in 2004. Cowboy up, cowboy up, Zimmer down. <laughs> when Pedro tossed Don Zimmer off to the side there. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and then of course I. I've, what was it? Ninety was it ninety nine, Benny? The Subway Series. When yeah, they played the Mets. What was, was that? P- ninety. I think it was two thousand. Wasn't yeah, it? Okay. two thousand. Yeah, Piazza. Piazza got beaten by Clemens, right? <laughs> yeah. Like that. Remember that? I remember that. Yep. Oh, well, I don't know. You're, you're not going to top Clemens throwing the bat back at him, think, saying he <laughs> thought it was the ball. Right. Yeah, that was that was a great series. Um, who, the, the Yankees ended up winning that series, right? Did yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was did. part of their three Pete. Yep, the three that's right. So yeah, so they were they were dominant at that time. But you know, does free agency play a role in all this after that? Because you don't see these dominating teams anymore like we used to see. Like, are you ever gonna get a, a you know a 39 Yankees team again or a 27 murderers row Yankees team ever again? Well, I mean, the the 39 Yankees, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was they that was their fourth of four uh uh, championships, and then from forty nine to fifty three, which was uh, Casey Stengel's uh, first five years right. as manager of the Yankees, they yeah. they won the, the world championship five years in a row. Wow. I, I don't think we'll I don't think we'll ever see that again. I mean, first of all, you have you know you have all the levels of playoff that you didn't have back then. All you all you had to do is win the you know when you're uh, you know the AL or the NL, you're in the World right. Series, then you got to yeah. win four games. Now you got to win what like eleven. Yep. My my yeah. thing is, can you imagine having four 20 game winners on one team nowadays? Yeah, that'll never happen again. I mean, I don't think there's a payroll big enough for that, unless yeah, it's it, something very it's, obscure. It's not even it's not even that. You're you're gonna be hard pressed to get 
two 20 game winners just because of how, how often starters, you know, I mean, with bullpen True. games and yeah. starters getting pulled in the fourth or fifth inning when the game's tied, you know, well, I mean, what are they think, getting? 32 starts what, now, Dan? What's that? Are yeah. they getting 32 starts a year? <laughs> Give or take, yeah. Yes, I mean, you, have, you only have 32 possible decisions. and you know, Right. But, I mean, you figure how many – when you go back to, like, the four the, the four or thir- uh, 20 game winners, you know, it takes, like, a Jim Palmer or somebody like that. How many of those games was, was the game tied in the sixth or seventh inning? Right. Yeah, and, and and he stayed on to pitch the ending. Now, fourth or fifth inning, game's tied, your starter's coming out. Yeah. So yeah, that's I would a say win that he it. could have had if he had stayed in That's that's gone. You're never going to get – you, you, I doubt you'll see that many 25, 20, 25 game winners again. You know, that would be a very interesting team. metric, though. If you looked at the, like, say, in the 60s and the 70s, the percentages, the percentage of decisions uh, as a percentage of starts right. To, uh, right. to now, I, I would think that had a significantly drop. Probably. I, I would say, yeah. was, you know, they were getting 40 starts a year, and if they were throwing 25 complete games – you know, now you know you already have 25 decisions, win or lost, and, you know, out of those 15, say you got another seven, right? Now you have 32 decisions. Now you're only getting 32 starts. I, well, th- I, I think money plays a huge factor in all this because everyone's trying to protect their investment. So, like Dan, you're saying, they're only going five or six innings. Right. When well, before, I mean, we, we would talk about pitch count. I mean, we don't yeah. even talk about pitch count anymore. It's Give me they an go idea. by innings. Right. But, I mean, to, to give you an idea, um, you know, like like – uh, Cellular had in 1970, he had 21 complete games. Wow. Right. Th- this year, this season that just ended a few months ago, yeah. the league leader in complete games was uh, Jordan Lyles in Kansas city with three. Wow. Three complete so, games. Three. Oh, and he led, he led the American league in complete games. And so, you know, if, if you're not throwing, I'm not saying you got to throw 21 complete games to get right. 20 wins, but, how, like I said, how many of those games and pitch, you know, are you seeing starters pulled in the fourth or fifth inning? Right. No decisions. You know, yeah. that's why it breaks my heart when, when, you know, it, one of the saddest stats in baseball history is that Nolan Ryan never won a Cy Young because Cy Young voters have always favored winning records. And he spent sure. 70% of his career on losing teams. Yeah. Wow. You know, you're, you're, you're leading the league in strikeouts. Your, your ERA is near the top. You're the most yep. dominant pitcher. And you yeah, have you know, seventeen no decisions that year. You know <laughs> you're 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 four you're four and eleven as a starter. Like you got worse run support in the majors. Like you're never going to get it. Yeah. You know. That, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever see that. That'd be amazing if we did though on a but random I mean, whim. Back, I mean, you think about it. You have to go back to to 2011 with James Shields in Tampa Bay. Yeah. You have you find a pitcher with double digit complete games again. Unbelievable. And, he, and his was only eleven. Like. But then, like Benny was saying, you go you not that far back, go back to the 70s and 80s, and you look at, you know, I'll throw a few random numbers out there. Danny McLean, 1968, 28 complete games. You know, wow. Juan, Juan Marshall, 30 complete games. Fergie Jennings, 1971, 30 complete games. I, you know, I think the current career, like for active players, the current career leader, I think, is Adam Wainwright of the Cardinals. And I think he has like 26 in his whole like 19-year career. These guys are doing that every season. Yeah, that's crazy. I wonder though, like, and and for the most part, I mean, like Seaver, you know, uh, Bob Gibson, all those guys, Marischal, right? They went season after season. Ryan never had an arm injury, yet these guys, like Otani, now is what on the second Tommy John, Jacob Degrom, who's the uh, the poster boy for Vagisil, he's on his second. I mean, (laughs) what you what's and if anything. The, the you know the nutritional science is much better now. Conditioning is like light years better. Yeah. Well, what's what's the difference? I think I think to me I think the pitchers back then you talk about the Seavers and all those guys they had a variety of pitches to choose from. Now I think it's one or two. It's fastball, and you don't see that illustrious curveball anymore. It's it's also it's also you look at like as an Orioles fan watching, you know, the mountains having Tommy John surgery and they don't expect him to play at all next year. Yeah. You know, he's a closer. Maybe yeah. he plays three, three, you know, on a bad time, you might keep him in for four, for four yeah. or five outs, but usually he's only in for one inning, yeah. but he's throwing hundred plus mile an hour fastballs, or he's got that ridiculous breaker, you right. know, 
that's it. Like you, you get closers having it's Tommy John two. surgery because yeah. they throw the fastball or they've got a sinker right. or you've got maybe, I mean, honestly, there's a couple closers out there that don't have a dominant fastball. No. They'll just kill you with a sinker or a curve or something, but you throw the same pitch, you know, it, it wouldn't take much. Like you said, you know, six, 70 Orioles between the four twenty game winners, you got 25 different pitches. I mean, sure. Jim Palmer threw yeah. everything. You know, yep. right. he, he had a sinker, he had a slider, he had a curve, he had a change. You know, you saw slurves, you saw, uh, you know, and different they, stuff didn't, back they then. didn't have pinch. They didn't have pitch counts back then either. Right. You know, they would come out. How you feeling? Oh, I can go another inning. Well, okay. Yeah. I, I got, <laughs> yeah. The, our arm is literally duct yeah, taped yeah. on. Like I got this boss. <laughs> the, the, the best, the best one would... was, uh, Tim McCarver when he'd go out to the mound and Bob Gibson would say, the only thing you know about hitting is you're not very good at it. Like, get the <laughs> hell out of here. The, I will say, though, you, you talk about, uh, to combine both of them, complete games and records, you want to talk about a record that will never, ever get broken again. Cy yeah. Young has the record. He pitched 749 complete games in his career. Oh, wow. my God. That's like yeah. that's that's insane. Yeah. That is, I mean, and then, and then Benny, going back to what you said, does that have something to do with nutrition and the foods they ate back then? Because there were not many processed foods back in those days as there are now. But we you know, know so I mean? much more about nutrition. You know, like these guys are taking supplements and things like that, which, you know, they, they never took back then. I honestly think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, back when we were kids, when I was a kid, uh, we weren't allowed to throw a curveball because, you know, the coach would say it's going to damage your arm. Exactly. Right? I remember I think that. Yeah, 11, 12-year-old kids now. They're, they're throwing curveballs and they're just set, they're setting themselves up for failure in the future. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, look at how many. Opinion. I mean, I don't know if you all follow like college really, you know, or minor leagues. You got, you know, 18, 19 year old kids in the, in the minor leagues or in college having Tommy John surgery. Cause, yeah. but, you know, they're like, like Benny said, they're, you know, 19 years old and they've thrown 10,000 curveballs in their life. But but Tommy's John surgery nowadays is nothing compared to what it was career ending back in the day. It was, but even know? so, I mean, you know, you'll never rebuild it to to what it was. No, no. You know, you, when you when you have guys like like Benny said, you got guys three four deep. You know, multiple surgeries on their elbow or their shoulder. By the time yeah. you're 25, it, it hurts to reach for the milk. Like right. You know, but I think too, uh, you'd never want to accuse people of anything they haven't been. <laughs> uh, convicted of, uh, except Barry Bonds. I don't care how many negative tests he's had. That man was juiced out of his mind. But um, one of the major side effects of most performance-enhancing supplements and, and drugs is is wear and tear on soft tissue. Oh, yeah, you might course. have larger muscles, but your joints, tendons, yeah. uh, and nerve endings in and around joints are predominantly more injury-prone. Well, uh, um, I, I can attest to that because that'll go back to the infamous Nomar Garcia Parra appearing on the cover of Sports Illustrated looked like he just stepped out of a, a bodybuilding contest and it was shortly thereafter he had a wrist injury that he couldn't he couldn't shake. Yeah. And they attributed that to his demise because he couldn't do all the stuff he was taking, which he knew he was taking something, he couldn't get over that wrist injury. And that's what really ultimately ended his career. And it's like he, what happened? Like he was in his heyday and here he is the poster boy for Sports Illustrated. And, you know, he's, you know, marrying Mia Hamm and all that stuff and, you know, yeah. living the big life and boom. So, yeah, it definitely the uh, well, steroids and everything. I, ben, Benny, uh, Benny, Benny and I are both wrestling guys. Uh, remember the Royal Rumble, not what, 15 years ago, Vince McMahon comes out oh, uh, to because they, they apparently bought. Well, they say they botched it, but, you know, that's up yeah. for debate whether or not that's scripted. But, you know, he, he steps into the ring to yell at Batista and John Cena tears both his quads. Not yeah. six months before he was yeah. on the cover of, of Men's Fitness. Yeah. Jacked out of his mind. Look at me at 60. I'm so, yeah. ins, you know. Yeah, they, well. they, there's, you know, obviously the steroid era in wrestling. I mean, it did obviously shorten a lot of careers as well as lives. Yeah, a lot of lives. Um, a lot of lives. And I, I that takes me back, you know, not to switch gears with wrestling, but it takes me back to that gym in, uh, where was it, Tampa or whatever, where it was Road Warrior Animal and uh, Mr. Perfect. They all worked out at the same gym and they were getting the same juice from the mm -hmm. same guy. And they all died. Bulldog, everybody. Yeah, Bulldog. Uh, uh, they were all working out this one gym. Yeah. And like, well, the, if you remember the the same the same doctor that that was caught up after the Chris Benoit incident, 
Oh know, yeah, yeah. Killed yep. himself and his family. Yep. That same doctor had prescribed drugs to numerous people that had either died or were dead within a year or two, yeah. and then others like William Regal and people like that that ended up having to go to rehab because it's like, oh yep. shit, you know, you're getting six month six month steroid prescriptions every couple weeks. Like, there's clearly something wrong with you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Look at Vince McMahon. I think he was on something as well. Yeah, I, I well, look at his transformation. And have you seen him lately? Yeah. At UFC and all that, those videos come. Yep. He looks With like he's and old all. and decrepit. I, like and he is deteriorating. And I'll say it. Time. I'll say it about McGuire and yep. um Barry Bonds is obviously the biggest example. Oh, Barry Bonds. No one, no one, period. Yeah. I don't care how many positive tests you have. Canseco said it in his book. You know, who would have thought he'd end up being the bastion of common sense in baseball? But right. yeah. <laughs> when <laughs> No one puts on 20 plus pounds of muscle in one off season after no the way. age of 30 without no chemical way. help. It does not happen. Well, how does your head size and your shoe size grow right, in yeah. your late thirties? Like, you know, yeah, at, I know. At, least, at least McGuire just got naturally bigger. Barry Bonds had to get a bigger batting helmet three of his last five years. Like, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you see those body transformations. You're like, nah, no yeah, way. Look, you look, know go, way. go find a, a, a trading card of Barry Bonds on the pirates or young oh my God. Sosa. Does that you know, picture remember yeah. Sammy Sosa back when he used to be back when he used to be black? You yeah. know, um, <laughs> have you seen him recently? No, I haven't. He, he, he's got. I mean, I, I understand he claims it's medical, but so did Michael Jackson. But he's got yeah. that transformation going for him. At oh, least he learned wow. English now. Remember, he he forgot how to speak exactly, English man. when he was before Congress. But he but was my, uh, he was uh, before he went with the you know, when he was at the White Sox. He was like a twelve. 12- Homer year guy. Yeah. All of a sudden now he's hitting, you know, 65. Then he then he came to Baltimore and got caught using cork bats. Yeah. But my my biggest question in regards to steroids with baseball players is they have a God-given talent. I mean, obviously hitting a 95 100 mile an hour fastball is a God-given talent. You can't teach someone to do that. And do steroids improve your vision with that? I understand the power aspect of it and all. Right. But does it really improve your vision where you can hit more home runs or drive in more runs. That was that's always you always hear that defense when they talk about Barry Bonds and stuff like that. Yeah. Steroids is not a magic pill. I right. can't like someone like me, you know, I can't take steroids and then go hit 50 home runs. You <laughs> steroids build on something natural. I mean, you look at guys like like Jay Cutler when he was you know really changed the game in the Mr. Universe competitions, <laughs> Ray, you know, Coleman and, and now Big Ramey and those guys. Right. Um, you know, they they'll tell you you still put in 10 hours a day plus in the gym. Oh, You're sure. still yeah. at bat. You still right. have to have that. Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, these, you know, uh, uh who is it? Teixeira, um, you know, ball of, players. Uh, Raphael Palmero. Ball players. You have to you have to have that hand eye. Steroids won't give you that hand eye coordination. That's what I'm saying. What it yeah. will do, however, it will increase your bat speed just because of right. the strength of your arms, and it will increase power. Steroids makes a fl- a, a a, a, a pop fly to the outfield, a home run. Yeah. You still have right. to hit the ball, right. but you're hitting a home run or you're hitting it harder to where it's farther out and it's going over the left field, left fielder's head instead of being caught. So yes, to say you take steroids and poof, you're instantly better. If that was the case, everybody be Everybody's hitting 70 doing. home runs that, a year. That's, no, a, that's, that's a great, true. you know, you got a guy like Sosa, you got a guy like Palmero who were fairly good contact hitters who hit, yeah. you know, not a great average, but hit for a decent average. Now a lot of these fly balls to the outfield, they're translating the home runs. That's why I think if like a Dave Kingman uh, ever took steroids, so right. and he'd still strike out 900 times a year. But then you know the the, the 40 home runs he hit instead of going 800 feet, you know, they went 850. I don't think it would have changed him. Right. Like somebody you know somebody now right. Boggs one year didn't he hit like 26 home I, runs where I he never hit a, anything close to that. It, if yeah. we can, if we can kind of circle back to what we what we started with talking about with the best teams ever, right. that's something that's also gets lost in history when you look at you know any really especially dead ball era, but any team yeah. before the 1930s when they started really redesigning ballparks, right. you know it didn't take much. Boston, great example. The yeah. center field wall at the old Boston ballpark was almost 600 feet. Yeah, you know from insane. from home plate, you're, you're yeah. not going to hit a home run. You go, right. Yeah, it was, it was insane. Uh, uh, cartoon, you, cartoon Casey at the bats not hitting a home run in that stadium. Well, you could you could fast forward now to Yankee Stadium and and what is it? Right field is like it, it's ridiculous. It's what three oh two or something like straight. Well, the, 
it's, Bal- it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Baltimore is a great example. This is the first season with the new Camden Yards layout where they, they pushed the right field wall back and raised it. Uh, kind of oh, okay, creating like yeah. a mini mini monster and they took yeah. some seats out but they added a bleacher section and home runs in the right field section of camden yards plummeted from yeah. the, 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 the the last 10 year average yeah. because yeah. all of a sudden you're that extra th- it, now it's not much but you right. had an extra you know you, how many how many highlights have you guys seen where the 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 um, you know, the outfielders jumping and just catching the ball at the at the wall, like just yeah. robbing the home run. If that yeah. wall is 10 feet further back, he doesn't have to do that. Right, exactly. You, know, you put the wall 30 feet back, you're taking 25, 30 home runs a year, poof, gone. Yeah, you're you making know? you're making highlight reels now. It, that's that's exactly. what's happening. And you know, obviously offense creates and wins or runs, but it also puts butts in seats. It's, they want to see also, the home run. They want to see all that stuff. So, yeah, And it's also, uh, you know, the, the idea of switch hitting, you know, yeah. how many, what, what there's only the sing you can count on one hand, the number of permanent switch hitters in the leagues now, it's you crazy. know, so, yeah. uh, and given that how, only a small percentage of the population is left-handed, you want that right field wall further back. Exactly. You, know, you want you want to make it harder for people batting, especially pitchers, the right on right matchup. Yeah. You know, um, you, you want to make that harder. I get it. I do. It's that's that that's one of the things that often gets lost in history with some of these teams in in the in the twenties. I mean, granted, the Yankees probably not so much because they had the money, but some of the smaller market teams might play an entire ball game with four baseballs. Yeah. Whereas right. the same, yeah. the same, you know, the Yankees up the street or use 50, of course you're yeah. going to get better hitting exactly. when you've got fresher baseballs, you yeah. know? Yeah. That, that, that takes you back to the home run years with McGuire and Sosa and all that, you know, they tried to get off the steroid thing, but they were saying, Oh, the balls were juiced now. You know, they, something's wrong with the baseballs. Like, really? Okay, let's. You know, and next, I, you know, they're appearing before Congress, lying their asses I, off. I would, you know, and it's funny. Uh, the the history major in me that year, Congress spent more time uh, oh, yeah. in session on baseball than they yeah. did on healthcare. Uh, it was a healthcare, yeah. Medicaid, and Social Security combined. Yeah. So. Yeah. And what was the reasoning all behind that? The well, the appear- idea was is at the time it's the same thing with the NFL. When, when they got involved with the Redskins was yeah. uh, uh, baseball had tax breaks. So if you're a corrupt organization that's getting uh, tax money, yeah. the, the IRS has to get in and therefore the government has to get involved to make sure you're clean. Plus, you know, you, you want to, with the president council on fitness and all that shit, you don't want America's pastime to be crooked and drug filled. The American council on fitness. <laughs> yeah. Remember when, when, when I, Reagan I remember brought that. out Arnold Schwarzenegger, come on yeah, kids. I remember that. You know, oh, yeah. I, look at me. I'm all natural. Take yeah. Hulk Hogan, you know, Are take you your vitamins me? and drink all some orange natural, juice. You my ass. Like me. <laughs> no way was he all natural. Those guys were on something. I mean, that was just everywhere. Venice beach, all those guys. Right. Well, that's why I, mean, I said, I, I grew up, you know, st- yeah, take, yeah. take your take your vitamins, say your prayers, and train yeah. hard. We just didn't know what vitamins they were talking about. <laughs> what was it Jesse Ventura said once in an interview? I'd hear Hogan say, "Take your vitamins," and my first question is, "Or uh, the oral or injectable ones?" Yeah, yeah, exactly, he exactly. Jesse. Yeah, and Jesse's a, a, a prime example because the steroids did him. 